We are in a series talking about the best Christmas ever, and I love Christmas music. I'm tired of it by the time New Year's gets here, but I love Christmas music. So, Megan, if you'd play us a little something as we think about what the greatest Christmas of all time looks like. Would you just get in your mind's eye and envision this with me? Just think about your perfect Christmas. All of your family in one place and no one is arguing. You have family coming in from out of town. You pick them up at the airport. No traffic. You drive right up to the gate. They load the bags right in for you and you get to bring them home. Then you get to your house on Christmas Eve. You're sitting by this beautiful fire burning in the fireplace. Snow falling ever so slightly outside your window. Not enough to get you stuck at church on Christmas Eve. But enough just to look pretty. And in the background, on your television screen, is the greatest Christmas movie of all time, which is... I don't know what you said, but I heard a Die Hard. It is definitely Die Hard. All is right in your Christmas world. All right, that's enough, Megan. You can stop. You're good. Or it's reality. And the Christmas music that's continually playing in the background is Mariah Carey. And even if you love the song, you're tired of it by now because it has been playing incessantly on our Christmas playlist for about 25 years now, I guess. It seems longer than that. Uh, You sit by a fire that's roaring so hot that you're just sweating and you look on your front porch and realize your Amazon packages are still not here and you don't know what your kids are getting for Christmas this year. You go to the airport to pick up your family members and oh, their flight was delayed or worse yet, it's been canceled. And you got this brand new, beautiful Christmas sweater you've been waiting to wear. And yesterday it was 25 degrees, but today it's 85 degrees. And now you have to wear this Christmas sweater that you paid way too much money for and you can't wear it again for another year. In the background, the greatest Christmas movie is not playing. It's Home Alone 3 again. (laughs) Which is not even the third best movie in the Home Alone franchise because Home Alone 4 is better than Home Alone 3. But what if this year could be different? What if this year as you approach your holiday season and you look in anticipation towards Christmas, what if this actually could be the best Christmas you have ever had? Who's down for that? Some of you don't really care. And the rest of you, we're going to talk about that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we open up Scripture today, as we look towards celebrating the birth of our Savior, as we look towards how we celebrate that this year. Father, I pray that you would give us some practical examples we can look at, some ways we can live it out in our life every single day and celebrate in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we think about having the best Christmas ever, much of that revolves around what your perspective is on Christmas. Now we have some sayings that go along with Christmas. Who's ever heard, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season? We all have heard that. Some of you might have it on a bumper sticker. Anybody got one of those? Coffee mug, hanging on a wreath on your door, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's become a phrase that has been recited so often, it's just become kind of a corny phrase even though it is exactly what is the season is about. Jesus is the reason for the season, but we don't always celebrate it that way. But what if there is, without even throwing out the corny phrases, what if there is actually one change that you can make this year? Just one change in perspective you can make this year that will change everything and give you the best Christmas ever. What if there's one thing that you can do that will make all of those Christmas gifts that you bought have so much more meaning? What if there's one change you can make that that will make your family be 
more cherished than they were before. What if there's one change you can make that, that when you look at these Christmas traditions that you, you and your family have probably spent years and years coming up with, what if there's one change that can give all of those more purpose? What if it's one thing we can do that will actually make this the best Christmas ever? There is one thing that we can do. And we see this in the attitude of the characters in the Christmas story. We, we see it in the attitude of, of the characters such as Mary and Joseph. And we even see it in, in the attitude of Elizabeth. But we're going to focus today on the attitude of the wise men in the Christmas story. Now, this message is, is kind of the whole series. It's not a, a series where we're digging deep into Scripture. This is practical things we can look at. So you can follow along if you want to, but we're going to look at several different passages today. So they will be on the screen just like normal if you want to follow along that way. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we read this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, as we think about our attitude going towards Christmas this year and the perspective that we approach Christmas with, all of us are going to celebrate something this year. Some of us will celebrate the birth of our Savior, and some of us will celebrate family. Some of us may celebrate the material blessings that often come along with Christmas. Some of us will celebrate traditions. We all will celebrate something. So the question is, as you approach Christmas, is what you're celebrating this season worth it? Is it worthy of your time and your devotion? Is it really changing anything by what you celebrate during the Christmas season? The bottom line for this whole series that we're going to look at is that when we approach Christmas with an attitude of worship, it is the best Christmas you'll ever experience. The best Christmas is a worshiping Christmas. I've been making y'all recite our bottom lines recently, so say it with me. The best Christmas is a worshiping Christmas. Now I'm going to be transparent. This series is not original to me. This is based on a, a series from Life Church and, and Craig Groeschel, a, a series called We Have Come to Worship, I think is the name of it. I'm not 100% sure about that. But when I was reading through this and, and kind of putting my own spin on it, I realized this is how you have the best Christmas ever. We look at the, the picture of the wise men. The wise men coming to find Jesus, and they weren't coming to see what they could get from Him. They weren't coming to Jesus to, to find this newborn king to see what he had to offer. They, weren't, they didn't care any gift that he may have for them. I mean, he, they're coming to find a little child. And they come to see not what they can get, but what they can bring him. How can they honor this new king? How can they worship him? Usually, for most of us, at least in the Western culture, the Western world, our Christianity, our faith is very self-centered. We, we focus so much on what we're getting out of our faith that sometimes we lose perspective of what our faith is really about. Just think about your prayer life for a minute. What have you prayed about in the last week or the last month? If you were to list all of your prayers, how much of it was, Lord, I need help here. Lord, take care of this. Lord, fix this problem for me. Lord, would you do this for me? Versus how much is, thank you God for who you are. Lord, I love you. Lord, help me to worship you with my life. Which side do we typically fall on? Now, Scripture tells us we should bring our, our prayers to Him in petition, in supplication. We should request things from God. He wants to know. He wants you to verbalize what your heart's desires and your needs are. But we often stop at that. And it becomes all about us and so self-centered that we begin to look at God as some sort of cosmic vending machine. 
where we'll go and we'll drop in our prayer quarters and we'll pull the button and we'll say, hopefully we're going to get a good candy bar and it's not going to get stuck. And we expect our prayers or our worship life or our faith life to give us something out of it. But look at the the attitude that the wise men go to find their king. The attitude that that they display gives us the reality that God is not here for us. God's purpose in this world is not us. He created us for Him. He is fine without us. But when we glorify Him through prayer, He is pleased, or worship, He is pleased with our hearts of worship. A Christmas centered on worshiping the King is the best Christmas you will ever experience. It will bring so much more value to your normal Christmas holidays. And I'm not preaching to tell you don't go buy gifts and don't do all the traditions. This is to help you enhance those things that you typically do at the holiday season. As we look through this over these next few weeks, we're going to see some different ways of worship, but today we're going to talk about posture. Posture matters in Scripture. You may remember several months ago we talked about postures in prayer and how it is important in Scripture for you to to take certain postures and surrender to prayer. Worship is the same way. It is an act of submission of our body when we worship. We we take postures of worship, and and maybe the most uncomfortable posture for a Baptist is this. Now, I didn't have the chance to look behind me today. I don't know if any of you were in a posture of worship this morning. Hopefully your heart was in a posture of worship. But was your body in a posture of worship? Were you in submission to the Lord in a posture of worship? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Some of you just cringe at the thought of doing that. There's a a comedian by the name of Tim Hawkins who did a video several years ago, a little bit on worship and what postures of worship look like. Some of you may have seen the video. It's one of the funniest Christian comedy videos that I remember because it is 100% accurate. And he said, you look at Christians and we have this certain posture of worship. And one of those postures is carrying the television. You know... Lord, and when we get really into it, it's a big screen television. When we get really into it, it's the high five in Jesus. It's yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Or if you're really, if you're really caught in the spirit today, it's the pageant girl kind of worship. Y'all know what the pageant girl worship is? Have y'all seen this video? It's It's, Lord, bless me, Lord. But if you're single, there is an alteration on that. It's the single girl worship. You got to switch hands. No ring. I love my Lord, but hey, if you're a good Christian guy, there's no ring on that finger. There's the, my fish was this big worship. And then the moment that you really know you've surrendered to God, it's the Simba worship. And you raise up Simba in dedication in the pride that all the animals can worship Simba and we give it all to God. Who all worships like that? Most of us don't, do we? Most of us, if we take a posture of worship, we might get to carry in the television. Very rarely, especially as Baptists. And I'm not knocking Baptists. I'm a lifelong Baptist. I did not grow up raising my hands in worship. But how hard is it to get to the Simba posture? Raising our hands can be a very uncomfortable thing. But let's look at some examples throughout Scripture of this. In Psalm 63, David writes this psalm when he's in the wilderness. Things are not going well for David in this moment. And here's what David writes to God. He says this, O oh God, You are my God. I earnestly search for You. My soul thirsts for You. My whole body longs for You in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Do you see, do you sense in what he's writing here how much he just has to have more of God? 
How it's not enough for him to just be present. He has to have God. He says, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love, hear this, is better than life itself. How I praise you. Verse 4, I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Postures of worship matter. It can be uncomfortable for us sometimes, though, and, and even for myself. I grew up in a Baptist church, and we sang the traditional hymns. We had an organ and a piano, and if you had a drum kit, you're going to hell. You know, those kind of things back in the 80s. But into the 90s, we started to, there started to be a little more movement in Baptist churches. And you started to see some people raising their hands in worship, and it made me really uncomfortable. And then when I was about 10 years old, maybe 11 years old, my mom, for some reason, decided she wanted to visit a Pentecostal church. And I went, and it was first terrifying because I had never experienced anything like that in my life. And then, as I look back on it, it's admiration. Because there's so much freedom in the way that they worship God that we so often don't have. Just last week, we're having, I thought, an incredible time of worship in our our closing of the service last week as we sang about singing praises to our Creator. And I felt compelled during that moment to hit my knees. Not just raise my hand, but hit my knees. And I look around and I'm like, everybody is going to get uncomfortable if I do that. And I start making excuses. You know, I'm 44. These knees don't bend all that well. And I don't know if you have knelt on this carpet. There is no padding at all. So I'm like, I'm not even going to be able to get up if I do this. And halfway through the song, we're still singing. And I just had to submit. I'm over here in the corner. So I would doubt anybody even noticed. But in that moment, tears filled my eyes. It was just me and God. Submission in our posture matters. And when we think about God's love and God's grace, how can we not respond? How do we not show gratitude in our bodies, in our movement, in our posture to God? It's important. We see it in in 1 Timothy. Paul in 1 Timothy, he's giving some directions to them about how we should go about worship. And and this is what he writes to Timothy. In chapter 2, verse 8, In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Now, if there's anyone who would have been uncomfortable taking posture, a posture of prayer that was in full submission like that, it would be Paul. If you remember, early in Paul's life, he hated Christians. And here he is, not only saying he takes postures of of worship that are in submission, he's telling others to do it in direction. He is not a command from Jesus, but it's an instruction from the Apostle Paul that we should Lift up holy hands to God. And notice what he says. I want... Throw that verse back up there. I want who? I want... Say it with me. Men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. Why does he pick on men? You can look in other areas of Scripture, and and men can often be translated as mankind or humankind where he's talking to everyone. But in this instance, Paul is specifically talking to men. Men, you are being instructed by the Apostle Paul to lift your hands in holy hands in praise and in prayer to God. Why does he do it? I believe he does it for number one, men are less likely to do it. We're we're more likely to stand stoic. Our hearts are good, but we're not moving those hands. But you're also called to be the leaders. 
Men, we are called to set the example in our homes, in our churches, in our, our faith relationships. We're called to set the example of how, what it looks like to be a disciple and to praise our God. He says, men, raise your hands, holy hands lifted up to God. So that brings us to a question. Why does it matter? Most of us are comfortable like this in worship. Some of us, we don't want to look too bad, so we're like this in worship. I see you over there, Tanner. Some of us, we, we, we want to look you know, like we're really into it, so we'll, you know. But how much freedom do you really have in worship? And why does it matter? I think it matters because everywhere you look in Scripture, it, it's apparent that God loves it when His children submit to Him even in their postures. If you're a parent, just, just think about how, how much you love it. I'll come home from work oftentimes after a long day and my kids, i got a nine-year-old, i got a four-year-old, and they're always happy to see me, which makes me happy. But then they're really loud, and I've worked all day. And my daughter especially, she just wants, she loves it when Daddy swings her. She, Christy freaks out when I do it because she's like, you're going to hit her head because I have to turn her upside down, swing her by her legs, you know, all that kind of thing. And if you've been to my house, my living room's not huge, so there is a chance her head's going in the fireplace. <laughs> but she's four. She's going to survive, right? So anyways... She wants me to do that, and I'm like, I have been working all day long. Just give me 30 minutes to just sit here and rest. And then there's those moments where she just looks at me. She walks over to where I'm sitting, and she just says, and I melt. I believe that's how God is with you. I believe when God sees us just raising our hands to Him in submission that He loves every second of it. When we're not afraid to raise our hands and say, God, I just need You. I believe He melts for us. It is a, an act that Paul tells us we should it's an instruction He gives us in worship that we should raise holy hands. And it is an offering to God. You know, offerings don't have to be financial. We normally think of an offering as a financial gift to God. That's important. God instructs us to give financially. But your offering to God does not stop at that box back there in the text you send to text to give. You, if you've been coming to Northview Church, you'll notice many times if I'm doing the opening prayer, I pray, Lord, this is an offering of praise to You that we're lifting up. Accept this offering to You. It is an offering of praise. Psalm 141, it says, O oh Lord, I am calling to You. Please hurry. Listen when I cry to You for help. Accept my prayer as an incense offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. Worship is an offering to God. And when we submit in our posture, we are saying, God, you have all of me, whether I'm uncomfortable or not, I am submitting to you. And Scripture says, raise holy hands to God, so I'm going to do it even in those moments when it makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable. Full transparency. Just to give you a heads up, as we close in a few moments, we're going to spend some time in worship. And I'm going to ask every one of you in here, men first, you lead the way. Raise your hands to the Lord. It may be incredibly uncomfortable to you. It may be the first time you have ever done it. But I'll tell you, for me, when I finally gave up on my pride and said, I'm not worried about anyone else, 
it was such a freeing experience in my worship with God. I think I've told you all the story before. It was, I'd been working in youth ministry for a while, and then I'd finally moved into vocational youth ministry, and I had to take this group of hoodlums to, to fuge camps in Greenville, South Carolina, and Megan was there, and Megan was a mean girl, but that's not got anything to do with what we're talking about. We were in a worship service. The, the kids go out on their ministry sites and the adults were in a, a Bible study. And instead of doing the Bible study, the band comes in and the pa camp pastor says, we're just going to worship today. So there's only adults in the room in this auditorium that seats about 1,500 people. There's probably 40 of us in there. So we're spread out. No one's near me. The room is dark. And I finally submitted. And I was free. Our posture matters. It is an offering to God, and it's also an example of going to battle. Some of you in this room are in a battle right now that no one else knows. Some of you are fighting things that no one has any idea except maybe your closest friends and family that you're going through. But God knows what you're going through. And raising our hands to worship and surrender to Him is an act of declaring war on the enemy. We see an example of this in Scripture. Now, I'm not going to tell you as I read this passage, this, this, this is taken a little bit out of context. So we're not learning that this is what we do. We're looking at an example that we see of someone else going into battle and what it looked like to raise their hands in victory. Here, here's what's happening. The Amalekites in Exodus, they are attacking God's people. So Moses says to Joshua, go, pick out some men. We're going to battle tomorrow. And he says, you get the men together tomorrow. I'm going to climb up on that hill. I'm going to raise my hands and we're going to fight. So, so let's read along. And this is what he says in Exodus 17. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hands, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites claimed the advantage. You see, Moses going in surrender to God saying, you have the battle. And when Moses would raise his hands, the Israelites are winning the battle. And when Moses would drop his hands down, they were losing the battle. It's a very interesting thing to read about what that had to do with it. I believe it had to do with full submission to God. So here, with me, go ahead, let's practice. Everyone raise your hands. Say winning. winning. Losing. Winning. winning. Losing. Winning. Losing. Winning. Losing. Winning. Tied. That's not really in the Bible. I just, it was time to stop. When he raised his hands, they were winning. When he lowered his hands, they were losing. But then he continues. Read, read what it says in verse 12. Let me find verse 12. <laughs> Moses' arms soon became so tired that he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands so his hands held steady until sunset. You see, what we see as an example here is going to battle in full submission to God. And when it just gets too tiresome, we fight together. They held up his arms because he couldn't do it any longer himself. But he still wanted to submit to God and his brothers in Christ well, not Christ at that moment, but his brothers in the faith came and just held his arms up because he couldn't do it anymore. Well, some of you are in battle and you can't do it anymore. 
That's why the church is so important. We come alongside each other. We hold each other up. And we submit to God. That's why I tell you so often that worship together is so important. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, Do not forsake the gathering together of believers. Because we worship together, we battle together. You know, historically, the, the image of raising your hands, it gives off two, two, per, two meanings. It, you raise your hands in victory, right? We raise our hands celebrating when our teams win a ball game. Auburn last night raised their hands and then they lost because they raised them way too early. But you raise your hands in victory when you win. When my cherished Atlanta Braves won the World Series, I'm always trying to work in the Braves references in case you didn't know. They're raising their hands celebrating the victory. When you see someone win an award, you'll often see them celebrate with raised hands in victory. It is a historical posture of victory. You know what else it is? Surrender. When you see someone being arrested or being approached by someone who has the upper hand, you raise your hands and surrender. So you have victory and you have surrender, but when you go to God and you submit, you have both. We're approaching the throne. We are declaring our surrender to God and our victory because of what He has done. And when we do that and we change our attitude towards how we are worshiping this Christmas, it will change everything for you. The best Christmas is a Christmas where you submit in worship. Everyone say it after me. The best Christmas is a worshiping Christmas. I'm going to ask the band to make their way back up here. And we're going to close in a time of worship. And as they come, will you submit, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you, in raising your hands in praise today? My prayer is that you will. And that this will not be the only time you surrender to Him in praise. That in this moment, you'll experience the freedom of surrender because posture matters. But only if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you in this room have never experienced the freedom of having a relationship with Christ. You have no idea why we're even talking about Praising on Christmas. Christmas is about family and gifts. But when it becomes about Jesus, it changes everything. Some of you have never experienced that freedom. And Scripture tells us you can experience that in this moment by surrendering your life to Jesus as your Savior. Here's what the Bible says. Every single one of us are eaten up with sin. Every single one of us are sinful people in need of a Savior. And some of you, the Holy Spirit may be convicting of that right now. That you have sin in your life and you need a Savior. And Jesus is the only way. If you are seeking a Savior that will give you purpose this morning, I want to ask you to have courage to move as we worship today. I want to be up here on the side. Come, talk to me or to Craig or to Greg or to Scott or to any, anyone else in here who you trust. Let us share with you what Jesus has done for us. But for those of you in here who have made that commitment to the Lord, who've experienced freedom in your life, will you surrender in this moment in praise to Him? I want to ask you to stand as we, we pray and we'll sing in just a moment. If you would bow your heads. And as your heads are bowed, as we, we're going to, going to pray, I want to ask you to go ahead and raise your hands and surrender. All across the room, raise your hands and surrender. Father in heaven, 
We come to you today. We want this Christmas to be the best ever. And we know that if we come to you in worship of your son, that it will be the best. So Father, give us the courage to surrender to you today. Let us experience freedom in worship to you today. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.